Every crime scene contains a profile of the perpetrator. Each piece of evidence, even the manner in which the crime is committed, provides clues to the identity of the murderer. Generally, profiling a crime scene is done only when there are no witnesses. In these cases, investigators must narrow the suspect list by comparing physical evidence with statistical data which aids the criminal list in determining the most probable culprits. In essence, a profile is an educated guess. In the early 1980s, agents at the Behavioral Sciences Unit of the FBI Academy studied dozens of cases and developed a technique for classifying crime scenes into one of two categories, organized and disorganized. Each type described a certain kind of person who was likely to have committed the crime. For instance, an organized crime scene describes a murderer who planned his crime carefully, chose his victim, hid the body, removed any incriminating evidence, and dozens of other traits. The disorganized crime scene is one in which the crime was committed suddenly and with no plan for deterring detection. It is this category that shares a great deal in common with the murder of Officer J.D. Tippett. The FBI found that, typically, the disorganized killer attacks quickly, catching the victim off guard in a location where the victim is going about his usual duties. The murderer often depersonalizes the victim by targeting specific areas of the body for excessive brutality. Overkill or excessive assault to the face is often an attempt to dehumanize the victim. In a disorganized crime scene, the victim is usually left in the position in which he was killed. No attempt is made to conceal the body. Fingerprints, footprints, and physical evidence are usually left at the crime scene, providing police with plenty of evidence. The J.D. Tippett crime scene clearly fits the profile of a disorganized murder. Tippett was caught off guard by his murderer and was left in the street where he fell. Although Tippett was hit fatally with an initial burst of gunfire, his murderer reportedly approached his body and fired a final shot into his head at close range. The killer then fled, unloading his gun and dropping incriminating evidence at the scene. The study of crime scenes led the FBI to develop a series of personality characteristics common to perpetrators of each category. Organized crime scenes were found to be usually associated with persons who had above average intelligence, were high school graduates with at least some college, were socially adept, came from a skilled labor force, and other narrowing characteristics. The murderer of a disorganized crime scene was likely below average in intelligence and a high school dropout. If he served in the armed forces, he may have been discharged within a few months. He has a menial job and a poor work record. He does not own a car and may be unable to drive, so he rides a bicycle or relies on public transportation. He is a sloppy dresser and a loner with solitary interests like watching television or reading books. He lives alone or with his parents. He may have a physical handicap or a speech impediment and has a poor self-image. The parallels between the FBI profile of disorganized murder suspect and the life of Tippett suspect Lee Harvey Oswald are numerous. Like the character profile, the man arrested at the Texas Theater was a high school dropout who joined the Marines, then took a hardship discharge. His employment history shows a string of menial jobs, none of which lasted long. He did not own a car, didn't have a driver's license, and used public transportation religiously. He had few friends and lived alone at the time of the shooting. He had a voracious appetite for reading, but suffered from dyslexia, a learning impediment that affected his reading, writing, and spelling. Assessing risk factors evident in the crime scene binds Oswald even closer to Tippett's death. Both the perpetrator and the victim are looked at when analyzing the risk factor, explains Herbert Luntz, a 26-year crime scene technician whose police work includes extensive work in the field of criminal personality profiling. For Officer Tippett, 
the risk factor is very low. It's the middle of the afternoon and Tippett is in a residential area. The likelihood of this type of crime being committed against him is very remote. On the other hand, the risk factor for the perpetrator to commit this crime in broad daylight in a residential area is very high. The potential for him getting caught is extremely high. So, in analyzing a crime scene, Lutz continues, the profiler asks himself, what pushes the perpetrator to commit an act when the risk factor is so high? In the Tippett case, it means the gunman feels he's caged or cornered. Something is fiercely driving him to forego other options at his disposal and shoot Tippett. For the perpetrator, it is a last resort. Another clue to the murderer's desperation, Lutz adds, is seen in the quickness with which the gunman reloads. This indicates that he feels he will need his weapon again almost immediately. In other words, he doesn't feel the threat has been totally eliminated by the death of Officer Tippett. What threat? What is Tippett's killer afraid of? Why is it so important that he avoid detention or capture? Here again, the kind of desperation evident in the crime scene profile can be seen in Oswald's steps before and after the Tippett shooting. Minutes after the fatal assault on President John F. Kennedy, Oswald left the Texas School Book Depository and walked east towards the downtown section of Dallas. Behind in Dealey Plaza, Oswald left witnesses who told police that shots had been fired from the building Oswald worked in. Some saw a rifle being withdrawn from the sixth floor window. A police search uncovered a 6.5 millimeter Manlicker Carcano bolt action rifle and three spent hulls. The rifle was later traced to a Chicago mail order house which had sold the rifle to an A.J. Heidel and mailed it to a Dallas post office box. The postal box and the handwriting on the order form were later proven to be Oswald's. A few minutes later, after leaving the depository, Oswald boarded a westbound bus headed for Oak Cliff. The details of Oswald's boarding suggest a man in a hurry. Oswald had a choice of two buses to take to his Oak Cliff address. The Marcellus bus that Oswald boarded passed within seven blocks of Oswald's room. The Beckley bus followed the same route out of downtown Dallas, but ended up on Beckley Street with a scheduled stop across from Oswald's room. Both buses had scheduled stops within one block of the book depository. Instead of waiting there, Oswald walked six blocks from the assassination scene, then boarded the Marcellus bus rather than wait for the Beckley bus, which could have taken him directly to his room. In fact, Oswald was in such a hurry that he flagged the Marcellus bus driver down in the middle of the block, not at a scheduled bus stop. Oswald rode the bus for approximately four minutes before it got bogged down in traffic crawling past the assassination site. The bus driver, Cecil McWaters, told authorities that a man in the car ahead of him got out and came back to the bus to tell him that he heard on the radio that the president had been shot. The handful of people on the bus were within earshot of the news. A woman immediately asked to get off the bus to make a train at one o'clock at Union Station. She requested a transfer in the event the bus driver broke free of traffic. As she departed, Oswald also approached the bus driver and requested a transfer, departing at about Lamar Street. The transfer was found in Oswald's shirt pocket after his arrest. After leaving the bus, Oswald walked three blocks south to the Greyhound bus station at Lamar and Commerce Streets. Cab driver William Whaley had just dropped off a passenger and was about to go into the terminal and buy a pack of cigarettes when he spotted Oswald walking toward him. May I have the cab, Oswald asked and climbed into the front seat. As Whaley slid back behind the wheel, an old woman looked past Oswald at the cab driver and said, Driver, will you call me a cab? Oswald opened the door a little as if he were going to get out and said, I will let you have this one. The woman replied, No, the driver can call me one. Oswald may have reasoned that giving up the cab would be more expedient than waiting for the cab driver to assist the woman. 
Whaley asked Oswald where he wanted to go, and Oswald replied, 500 North Beckley. Whaley headed toward that address. By then, police cars with sirens were crisscrossing everywhere. Whaley turned to his passenger and remarked, What the hell? I wonder what the hell is the uproar? Oswald said nothing, which Whaley took as a sign that he was the type of passenger who doesn't like to converse. From that point on, they rode in silence. Whaley's route took Oswald past his room, which provided Oswald with the opportunity to inspect the premises. The fact that Oswald did not have the cab driver take him directly to his room at 1026 North Beckley is clearly deceptive. As the cab neared the northwest corner of Beckley and Neely, Oswald said, this will do fine. The trip meter showed 95 cents. Oswald paid with a dollar bill, got out without a word, and crossed over in front of the cab to the east side of Beckley and headed south. Whaley put the cab in gear, turned around, and drove off. Oswald turned north and hurried back to his rented room. The fact that Oswald started south, then turned north after Whaley drove off, is another suspicious act which also seems designed to obscure his true destination from the cab driver. It was just before one o'clock. Housekeeper Erlene Roberts had heard from a neighbor that the president had been shot and was adjusting the rabbit ears antenna on her television set. Oswald burst in and scurried to his room. Mrs. Roberts remarked, Oh, you sure are in a hurry, but Oswald did not respond. According to Mrs. Roberts, he remained in his room about three or four minutes. While there, Oswald changed clothing, tucked a thirty-eight caliber revolver into his waistband, and slipped into a zipper jacket. Oswald trotted from the house and was spotted a moment later by Mrs. Roberts standing near a bus stop on the east side of Beckley. The time was approximately 1 p.m. According to eyewitnesses, Oswald was next seen nine-tenths of a mile from his rented room walking west on 10th Street near Denver. A reconstruction of events indicates the time was approximately 1.13 p.m. Questions arose during the Warren Commission investigation over whether Oswald could have covered the distance between the boarding house and the murder scene in the allotted time. A number of studies determined that it would have taken Oswald 12 minutes at a brisk walk to reach the corner of 10th and Patton. However, these early studies assumed Oswald was walking east on 10th Street. According to the original police reports, Oswald had managed to get to a point east of the shooting scene and was heading back in a westward direction. No doubt, Oswald's new route would have taken more than 12 minutes to cover. Some critics have charged that the time element is so tight it defies belief. But could Oswald have gotten there another way? That was a question Dallas officials pondered at the time. There was a lot of speculation that he was not too far from the interstate that leads south out of Dallas towards Austin, former Assistant District Attorney Bill Alexander recalled. We thought that maybe he had been there and missed a connection. I personally went down to the transit company and went over the logs for that period, and at that time the cab company required all cab drivers to keep a written record of the time where they picked up a passenger, where they took him to, and the time they discharged him. We couldn't find anything that indicated that there was even cabs out there. We also had all the bus schedules checked and all the bus drivers interrogated. The drivers were asked if, one, if they saw a guy matching Oswald's description, two, if they had picked up a passenger of that description, and three, where they took him. Zero, zero results. All negative. If Oswald did hitch a ride, it apparently had to come from the private sector. Critics are quick to point out the possibility of conspirators, but it's difficult to imagine any believable scenario that has conspirators picking up Oswald at his room only to discharge him a short distance later. Perhaps an innocent citizen gave Oswald a lift that afternoon and was later afraid to come forward and admit it for obvious reasons. Or maybe the answer is as simple as it appears. Oswald walked to 10th Street. 
But could Oswald have gotten there within such a tight time frame? Former assistant District Attorney Bill Alexander, who talked to residents along Oswald's suspected route, thought it unlikely that Oswald could have gotten to the scene on foot without being spotted. There are enough old people that live in that neighborhood, Alexander reasoned, that are at home that in order to make that distance on foot, he would have had to have double-timed a big part of the way, thus drawing attention to himself. Somebody would have seen him. Negative. I don't know how he got there, and nobody else does either. Alexander's belief that the residents of Oak Cliff would have noticed a man hurrying along the sidewalk doesn't allow for the fact that many people were indoors watching television coverage of the president's assassination. Isn't it possible that Oswald might have slipped down the near-empty side streets without being seen? In the end, the question of whether Oswald could have covered the distance on foot hinges on time factors that are far less stringent than most critics admit. Investigators clocked reenactments of Oswald's movements after leaving the depository and came up with approximations that compare favorably with one another. But these time reconstructions are only estimates and cannot compensate for factors that might have aided or inhibited Oswald's travel. No one can be certain of the exact times Oswald arrived at his room or the precise moment he was last seen at curbside. If Oswald did manage to get to 10th and Patton on foot, either walking or even running part of the way, he only needed to traverse an extra block and a half, then reverse his direction to be in the position witnesses described. At walking speed, this extra distance would take approximately 90 seconds. Given the fair degree of uncertainty inherent in Oswald's reconstructed movements, it seems apparent that Oswald's appearance on 10th Street is not outside the realm of the possible. And one thing is certain. Eyewitness testimony and physical evidence proves Oswald's presence on 10th Street. Twelve witnesses saw the killer either shoot Officer Tippett or flee the scene. Helen Markham, Barbara and Virginia Davis, Ted Calloway, and Sam Gunyard each picked Oswald out of a lineup the night of the murder. William Scoggins identified Oswald the next day. Warren Reynolds, Harold Russell, and B.M. Pat Patterson subsequently identified Oswald from photographs. Jack Tatum noted in a 1986 interview that Tippett's killer had one trait firmly identifiable with Oswald. The one characteristic about Oswald that I saw and will never forget, Tatum said, was his mouth seemed to curl up as if he was smiling. I saw that when he was looking into the squad right before the shots. I noticed that same characteristic when I saw him later on TV. Barbara Jeanette Davis recalled the same trait in testimony before the Warren Commission. He looked at her, Markham, first, and then looked at me, and then smiled and went around the corner, Davis recalled. The curling of Oswald's mouth at the corners was a result of pursing his lips. It was a nervous or unconscious gesture that can be seen in many news films of Oswald in New Orleans and Dallas. Oswald's nervous smile was seen two days later as a smirk to Jack Ruby and may have been the catalyst for Ruby's vengeful act. When the gunman fled the murder scene, he was seen unloading his pistol. Despite some early reports that the weapon was an automatic, eyewitness descriptions of the unloading process provide strong indications that the weapon used was a revolver like the type Oswald had in his possession at the time of his arrest. Ballistic evidence proved that the four bullets dug from Tippett's body also matched the class characteristics five lands, five grooves, right twist of Oswald's revolver. Further, signs of gas erosion on the slugs and minute striations were consistent with test bullets fired from Oswald's revolver. Experts concluded that Oswald's revolver was among those weapons that could have fired the shots. 
the four cartridge cases recovered from the scene were proven to have been fired in Oswald's revolver to the exclusion of all other weapons in the world. Although two of the shells were first identified as automatics, it was later admitted that the identification was an assumption based on the close proximity of the shells to one another. Criticism about the handling of the same two shells soon followed, but failed to account for the fact that witnesses saw Tippett's murderer unloading a revolver, or the fact that the remaining two shells had a clear chain of possession and were positively identified as cartridges fired in Oswald's revolver. Finally, a jacket was discovered along the route taken by Tippett's fleeing killer. Oswald, who was last seen leaving his rooming house zipping up a jacket, was spotted shortly after the Tippett shooting minus the jacket he had donned. The recovered jacket was later found to contain fibers matching the shirt Oswald was wearing when he was arrested. The evidence of Oswald's presence at the scene of the murder is substantial. His demeanor and suspicious actions which led directly to the confrontation with Officer Tippett are a natural extension of the behavior that began with his departure from the depository. As Oswald approached the corner of 10th and Patton from the east, he was in a position to spot J.D. Tippett's patrol car moving toward him. Eyewitness testimony suggests that Oswald reversed his direction, which very well may have been the reason Tippett's suspicions were initially aroused. As eyewitness Jack Tatum drove past, he could see the smug expression on Oswald's face as he spoke to Tippett through an open vent window. Perhaps... Tippett noticed something that further aroused his suspicion, sweat. Oswald had just covered a considerable distance in a short period of time and yet was still wearing his zipper jacket. Given the 68 degree temperature that day and the physical exertion he had just expended, Oswald probably was sweating. Did Tippett wonder why he hadn't taken off his jacket? The brief conversation ended with Tippett getting out of the car and approaching Oswald, whose stress and anxiety had risen to the point of murder. In a flash, Oswald pulled his revolver and struck down the officer with a barrage of bullets. Perhaps almost as an afterthought, Oswald returned to the street to deliver a final blow to the already fatally wounded Tippett. In its final report, the House Select Committee on Assassinations noted that this action, which is often encountered in gangland murders and commonly is described as a coup de grace, is more indicative of an execution than an act of defense intended to allow escape or prevent apprehension. 
The committee, which took a superficial look at the Tippett shooting, noted that the meaning of this evidence must remain uncertain. Why would Oswald execute Tippett? The committee's suggestion doesn't seem to make much sense in light of the rest of the evidence. The two men did not know each other, and it seems unlikely that Oswald would have fired the final shot to prevent Tippett from identifying him, since plenty of witnesses were left unharmed. Assuming Oswald didn't kill Tippett with a single burst of gunfire, as suggested by the testimony and actions of Ted Calloway, perhaps the final shot described by Jack Tatum was nothing more than an unconscious act meant to dehumanize Tippett's murder, a fact statistically associated with this type of murder. One of the family killed him. I don't believe it. Stop it. Nobody can call my kin. Maybe it wasn't your kin. Maybe it was you. No, if it wasn't, who was it? Jesse? Sarah? Ruth Ann? Ah, he's, he's just trying to rattle us, make us suspect each other. Well, it won't work. None of us is guilty. Well... Well, it's getting late. Why don't you go to bed? But before you go to sleep, remember one thing. Murder is a progressive disease. It gets easier to kill. With Tippett dead in the street, Oswald quickly reloaded his revolver, a sure sign he anticipated similar encounters with law enforcement. A zigzag route took Oswald out to Jefferson Boulevard, back behind the Texaco service station where he dropped his jacket in an effort to change his appearance, and finally back to the alleyway running west between the boulevard and 10th Street. Hampered by the police search, Oswald spent nearly 20 minutes covering the next six blocks. Shaken and disheveled, Oswald was spotted stepping into the glass vestibule of Hardy's Shoe Store on West Jefferson. Shoe Store manager Johnny Calvin Brewer had heard a siren and looked up in time to see Oswald step into the recessed foyer, his back to the street. A police car approached and made a U-turn. As the sirens grew fainter, Oswald looked over his shoulder, turned, and continued westward up Jefferson. Within a moment, a second police car approached, sirens wailing, and passed the shoe store heading west. Brewer stepped out to the sidewalk to see what was going on. The squad car had just passed Oswald, who quickened his pace. Brewer could see the patrol car stopping a few blocks ahead. So could the Texas Theater ticket taker, Julia Postal, who had come out of the ticket booth. And apparently, so could Oswald, who slipped behind Postal's back and into the theater. By chance, Brewer saw Oswald's suspicious act. The shoe manager alerted the ticket taker, and they called police. When the house lights came up, Oswald rose and stepped to the aisle. Police were pouring into the lobby. He turned and sat back down. Oswald had encountered police four times after leaving the depository, and each meeting evoked some kind of suspicious behavior in Oswald. When Officer Nick McDonald asked Oswald to stand, he rose, lifted his arms in surrender, and said, It's all over now. Suddenly, he socked McDonald between the eyes and pulled the revolver as a half dozen officers wrestled him to the floor. All of Oswald's action in the 90 minutes following the assassination suggests suspicion, desperation, and guilt. Each characteristic fits the type of perpetrator whom criminal profilists see as responsible for Tippett's murder. When Oswald's mental state is combined with the overwhelming physical evidence, there can be little doubt that Lee Harvey Oswald murdered J.D. Tippett. Unlike an innocent man, Oswald did not cooperate with police upon capture. When first confronted by homicide detective Jim Lavelle and before police had linked him to the book depository, Oswald made a remark that continues to intrigue the former lawman. 
I asked him about shooting the police officer and he said, I didn't shoot anybody, Lavelle recalled. Now, I've handled a total of three police murders and they usually say, I didn't shoot the cop or I didn't shoot that officer. But that wasn't what Oswald said. He said, I didn't shoot anybody. Now maybe I've read more into that than I should have. But I got to thinking later on that the reason he said that was because he knew we were going to accuse him later on of shooting the president. So he just got his word in early. I didn't shoot anybody. Oswald's responses to police questions are filled with lies and half-truths. Captain Will Fritz asked Oswald why he had rented the room on North Beckley under the name O. H. Lee. Oswald claimed the landlady did it because she didn't understand his name correctly. Yet, Oswald signed the room register O. H. Lee in the presence of two witnesses. When questioned about leaving the depository, Oswald told Captain Fritz that he left by bus and rode to a stop near home and walked on to his house. When confronted with William Whaley's account of the cab ride, Oswald admitted he did take a cab after the bus he was on got hung up in traffic. Oswald claimed he went to his room and changed trousers, then got his pistol and went to the movies. When asked why he carried a gun, Oswald replied imprudently, you know how boys do when they have a gun, they just carry it. When quizzed about where he got the pistol, Oswald told Fritz that he bought it several months before in Fort Worth. The FBI eventually traced the pistol to a mail order house and found that it had been ordered under the alias A.J. Heidel. The handwriting on the order form was Oswald's and the name matched a forged selective service card that he had in his wallet at the time of his arrest. Oswald's caustic remarks at the police lineups have often been cited as reasons to suspect the authenticity of the eyewitness identifications. However, few have considered that Oswald may have disrupted the show-ups for his own purpose. There's no doubt in my mind that he was trying to disrupt the lineup, former Detective Jim Lavelle said firmly. I'm sure what he was thinking was that if he created enough confusion or controversy that when we presented that particular lineup in court that he could argue that the reason they picked him was because he was fussing. So he'd get that lineup thrown out of court. Hey, it might have worked. I don't know. It depends. One on the judge and two on the testimony of the eyewitnesses. But William Scoggins so promptly identified him that it left no doubt in my mind that he was making a good identification. When Oswald started that, Scoggins said, well, he can bitch and holler all he wants to, but that's the man I saw running from the scene. There seems little doubt that Oswald's motive for killing Tippett is tied to the crime committed just 45 minutes earlier. Lee Oswald's actions following the assassination, including the murder of Officer Tippett, suggest deep involvement in the death of President John F. Kennedy, whatever his role. One mystery, however, remains to be explored. Why was Oswald on 10th Street at the time of his fatal encounter with Tippett? It is a question that has haunted some Dallas lawmen since 1963. One of the questions that I would like answered is why Oswald was where he was when he shot Tippett, former Dallas Assistant District Attorney Bill Alexander said. I would like to know how much farther to the south and east he had been because he was, in effect, quote, returning, unquote, to an area that was closer to his apartment. I feel like if we could ever find out for sure why he was there, then maybe some of the other mysteries would be solved. For instance, was he supposed to meet someone? Was he trying to make a getaway? Did he miss a connection? Was there a connection? If you look at Oswald's behavior, he made very few non-purposeful motions. Very seldom did he do anything that did not serve a purpose to him. People who have studied his behavior feel there was a purpose in his being where he was, and I for one would like to know what that was. 
Over the years, several attempts have been made to explain why Oswald was on 10th Street. Where was he headed? One of the earliest proposals was that Oswald was on his way to Jack Ruby's apartment on South Ewing Street in Oak Cliff, but investigators failed to find a link between the two men. Even today, there is no credible evidence that Oswald and Ruby ever knew each other. Another possible explanation for Oswald's presence on 10th Street was offered by Warren Commission Counsel David W. Bellin in an early draft of the Warren Report. Bellin hit on the idea that Oswald may have been trying to make good the bus transfer he had in his pocket when he was arrested. A subsequent investigation showed that Oswald's transfer was good at only one stop in Oak Cliff at Marcellus and Jefferson. It was marked for 1 p.m., which made it valid for 15 minutes or the next available bus. The Lancaster Road bus was scheduled to pass at 1.30 p.m. and would have taken Oswald to Greyhound bus connections through Laredo, Texas and on to Mexico. Bellin and his commission colleagues figured that Oswald had just enough money on him to reach Mexico. He might have even used his pistol to obtain more, they reasoned. The escape scenario made it to the August 7th draft of the final report before it was cut for being speculative rather than factual. No doubt the Warren Commission was anxious to dodge the international implications as well. Still, Bellin's theory has one fatal flaw. The argument hinges on the Warren Commission's mistake belief that Oswald was walking east on 10th toward the bus stop where the transfer would have been good. However, Dallas police were told by eyewitnesses at the scene that Oswald was walking west on 10th Street. All of the original police reports reflect that truth. So, in effect, Oswald was walking away from the only bus stop where the transfer could have been used. Had Oswald already been to the stop but was scared off, three and a half minutes after the Tippett murder, a Dallas County Sheriff Patrol unit radioed from the corner of 10th and Jefferson, about 500 feet from the Marcellus bus stop where Oswald's transfer could have been used. If that patrol car was in the vicinity a few minutes earlier, it might have been enough to dissuade Oswald from hanging around until the bus showed up at 1.30 p.m. Another suggestion appeared in Albert H. Newman's 1970 book, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the reasons why. Newman tried to show that Oswald's final destination was the home of General Edwin A. Walker, where Oswald was determined to complete his failed 1963 attempt to assassinate the provocative political figure. Newman pointed to the testimony of Earlene Roberts, who stated that she observed Oswald standing near a downtown-bound bus stop shortly after arming himself in his rented room. Fearful of being spotted near his rooming house, Newman believes, Oswald hoofed it south toward the bus stop in front of the Jefferson Branch Library. According to Newman, Oswald planned to take a bus to the central transfer point in downtown Dallas from where he could board another bus that would take him within a block and a half of Walker's home. But two blocks short of his destination, Oswald bumped into Tippett and the plan was aborted. Newman's Oswald is a man on the offensive. Newman sees the Kennedy assassination as an act of ultimate suicide, where Oswald, knowing there can be no escape, leaves $170 and his wedding ring on his wife's bedroom dresser. When luck and clever calculation allow Oswald to escape the depository, Newman finds the loner desperate to accomplish one more task. Newman believes that Oswald's return to the rooming house to arm himself is an act of aggression rather than one of defense. According to Newman, the target is Walker, whom Oswald never forgot. Newman builds a rather convincing case for this theory, although a few details remain bothersome. According to Newman, Oswald doesn't bring his pistol to work the morning of the assassination because he's afraid of being searched when he attempts to leave the depository. Why wouldn't Oswald simply stash the revolver outside the depository building? Why risk returning to his rented room? 
one he fears the FBI may already know about, only to return to the central transfer point located a few blocks from the depository. Perhaps Oswald's trip to Oak Cliff was not part of the planned double murder Newman envisions, but an unpolished afterthought. If true, the normally calculating Oswald was taking a big gamble, considering that he didn't know whether his target was even home at the time. In fact, General Walker was in Shreveport, Louisiana the day of the assassination. Finally, and more importantly, Newman's theory hangs on the idea that Oswald was waiting for a northbound bus moments after leaving the rooming house, yet the housekeeper's testimony shows that Oswald's intentions were not that clear. I saw Lee Oswald standing on the curb at the bus stop just to the right, and on the same side of the street as our house, Mrs. Erling Roberts told the Warren Commission. I just glanced out the window that once. I don't know how long Lee Oswald stood at that curb, nor did I see which direction he went when he left there. Was Oswald waiting for a bus, as Newman suggests, or preparing to cross the street? A week after the assassination, Mrs. Roberts apparently told a Washington Post reporter that she thought Oswald was headed north towards a neighborhood shopping center. In fact, Oswald was known to have brought bread, lunch meat, and jelly to his room from a nearby quick service market. Although it is unlikely that Oswald was going grocery shopping, it's worth noting that Roberts didn't have the impression that Oswald was waiting for a bus, despite his proximity to the stop. Why Oswald was at curbside and where he was headed remains a mystery. Finally, Newman's explanation that Oswald was headed south to the Jefferson Branch Library bus stop fails to find support. Like David Bellin's escape theory, the idea relies on the Warren Commission finding that Oswald was walking east on 10th Street when Tippett approached him. In fact, as we have seen, Oswald was walking west, away from Newman's theoretical destination. Had Oswald already been to one of the two suggested stops and decided not to wait for the bus? Perhaps, but then the question of where Oswald was headed remains unanswered. The question of where Oswald was headed remains puzzling. His hasty return to the Oak Cliff rooming house to retrieve his pistol and all the ammunition he owned suggests that he anticipated some kind of confrontation. The jacket served to conceal the weapon and potentially protect him from the expected cool night air. Both the retrieval of the pistol and the wearing of the jacket are signs that he didn't plan to return to his room anytime soon. Yet, Oswald must have been keenly aware that the $13.87 in his pocket couldn't take him very far. Oswald seems ill-prepared for the aftermath of the assassination. The erratic return to his room and lack of funds suggest that Oswald's actions after leaving the depository were unplanned, spontaneous reactions to the situation he found himself in. Perhaps Oswald initially thought that he could escape the area on the public transit system as he had done after the failed April 1963 attempt to assassinate General Walker. That might explain Oswald's decision to get a bus transfer and even his presence on 10th Street a short distance from where the transfer could be used. The fact that Oswald was spotted near the corner of 10th and Denver a little more than 13 minutes after leaving his room, located nearly a mile away, suggests that he couldn't have gotten much farther east or south. There simply wasn't enough time. If Oswald was initially headed east toward a bus stop, as Bellin and Newman suggested, it may be that he had second thoughts and turned back west. After all, Oswald's initial actions after leaving the depository were focused on getting to his room to recover his pistol. But once armed and back out on the street, Oswald had an opportunity to ponder his predicament. In fact, the walk to 10th Street may have been the first real chance Oswald had to contemplate his situation since leaving the depository. Oswald was not stupid and surely would have realized that his next move required some careful planning. 
Could he have decided that it would have been better to hide out until nightfall? The extra few hours would buy him both the time to conceive a plan and the cover of darkness to execute it. The perfect spot to hide out in Oak Cliff was the Texas Theater, where Oswald could sit undisturbed for hours. Best of all, the theater was only seven blocks from his current location. Had Oswald turned west and started for the Texas Theater, his ultimate destination, just before his encounter with Tippett. It's worth noting that it took Oswald nearly 20 minutes to cover the distance between the Tippett murder scene and the Texas Theater, a 10-minute walk under normal circumstances. The delay was no doubt due to the number of lawmen that poured into the area following Tippett's death. Oswald was surely forced into alleyways and side streets during his flight westward. Indeed, Ted Calloway reported that Oswald wasn't anywhere along Jefferson Boulevard when he and cab driver William Scoggins gave pursuit. So why, then, was Oswald back on Jefferson Boulevard when shoe store manager Johnny Brewer spotted him? Returning to the heavily traveled boulevard was extremely risky and did ultimately result in Oswald's capture. Why would Oswald risk it? Could it be that the risk was necessary because Oswald's destination, the Texas Theater, was within that very block? After 50 years, it is unlikely that we will ever know with any degree of certainty where Oswald was headed at the time of his fateful encounter with J.D. Tippett. It is the one loose end that remains frustratingly out of focus. Let me interrupt here, folks, if I may, and give you my speculation on Oswald's movements after he left the depository. Me thinks that he thought he was going to be caught, and that's why he left 90% of his money and his wedding ring with Marina that day. He left himself $13.78, or was it $13.87? I can't remember which just in case he didn't get a shot off at the president because there might have been workers on the sixth floor watching from there. They were working up there in the first place anyway. There might have been workers up there. Maybe the president's motorcade wouldn't even come by. Things like this happen to a president. Hey, Mr. President, something just happened in the world We've got to get you back to the White House. This is an emergency. Things happen like that. So the motorcade might not have even come by. So Oswald left himself enough money to get back home that day, buy some lunch, whatever, and end of story. But as we all know, he did get the shots off. He shot the president and he got out of the building. God knows what was going on in that man's mind when he walked out the front door there and started walking down Elm Street. I just shot the president, and I'm walking down the street, a free man. Nobody knows what I just did. Nobody knows that I did it. My God. And then we know he must have thought, at first, I've got to get back to my rooming house and get my pistol. That's why the bus, that's why the cab ride. And like Mrs. Roberts said, when he left the rooming house, she looked out the window to see where he, where he was going, and there he was, standing in front of the house, on the curb, near the bus stop. As Myers says in his book, this is the first time he's had time to contemplate a plan. What can I do now? Where do I go? So, again, me thinks he wasn't going anywhere in particular. That's a chance. I mean, that, that's a possibility. He wasn't going anywhere in particular. The man did not own a bicycle. He did not own a car. All he had was his feet, so he started walking. He obviously can't stay at the rooming house. They're eventually going to find out that he's not at the depository. What's his address? They're going to find out that his rooming house is over there on Beckley Avenue, so he's got to get out of there. And as I said, he doesn't own a bike, he doesn't own a car, all he's got is his feet. He's got to start moving and get out of there. 
So, again, he might have just been walking anywhere to get away because he didn't plan to get away. Now he has to think while he's moving. I know I can't stay at the rooming house. I've got to go. So that's my speculation. It's a possibility. Of course, we don't know. Still, it is important to recognize what is clear. Oswald's actions after the assassination suggest some desperate purpose. The ride on a bus, the change to a taxi, the quick stop at his rooming house to grab his pistol all seem focused towards some obscure goal. Officer J.D. Tippett was an obstacle to that goal, a roadblock that had to be eliminated. Tippett's murder complicated Oswald's situation immensely and no doubt increased his anxiety to an unbearable level. When police closed in at the Texas theater, Oswald's desperation became so great that he tried to kill Officer McDonald, or was the bullet in the chamber meant for himself, an exclamation point to his final declaration. Although Oswald's death at the hands of Jack Ruby ended any real chance of learning the truth about Oswald's reasoning, in light of the evidence presented in this book, there can be little doubt that he was responsible for Tippett's death. The eyewitness testimony and the physical evidence, both forensic and ballistic, provide a very strong foundation for the belief in Oswald's guilt. Few murder cases have endured the kind of scrutiny that the deaths of Officer J.D. Tippett and President John F. Kennedy have provoked. Both murders have long since risen to legendary status. Through many years of government blunders and increasing apathy, a cynical populace has transformed the desperate loner into an innocent lamb caught up in a diabolical web of injustice. Many of the claims that have surfaced in the intervening years have enough sense of reality that we feel they must be true. But can one allow what feels true to displace what is true? For those who knew Oswald, a certain reluctance comes with the acceptance of all the evidence against him. For Lee's brother, Robert Oswald, there is one personal recollection that forms a final knot. It is a small but telling footnote to the Tippett story. In the 1967 book, Lee, a portrait of Lee Harvey Oswald by his brother, Robert Oswald wrote of a rather trivial incident that came to mind after the assassination. One day in 1957, while Lee was on leave from the Marine Corps, the two brothers were riding in a car. Robert, who was at the wheel, noticed a car tailgating them as they approached a red traffic light. Fearful that a collision would result from a sudden stop, Robert did the only thing he could think of. He ran the traffic light. Almost immediately, they were pulled over by police. Robert tried to explain his actions, but the cop was unsympathetic. But the other guy would have been at fault, the officer retorted and handed Robert a citation. As they pulled away from the curb, Lee Oswald looked back over his shoulder and muttered, That dumb cop. Robert had no reason to remember the incident and didn't give it any thought until after the assassination when he learned that one of the witnesses to the murder of J.D. Tippett heard the killer say either, Poor dumb cop or poor damn cop. The precise why of Oswald's crime remains elusive, but despite the errors, misjudgments, and assumptions that investigators and critics have injected into this murder case over the years, the evidence against Lee Harvey Oswald remains clear and damning. Lee Harvey Oswald killed Officer J.D. Tippett. The evidence is overwhelming. With that verdict admitted, certain doubt must accompany Oswald's plea to reporters in the crowded corridor of Dallas Police Headquarters. I didn't shoot anybody. 